All right, everybody. Um, this is uh, abusing silent mitigations, understanding internet explore, uh, weaknesses in Internet Explorer's isolated heap and memory protection mitigations. We've got a lot to cover, so we're just going to dive right in. So today we're going to go over a comprehensive set of research we did uh, in mid-2014 uh, related to the isolated heap and memory protection mitigations that were introduced to make UAF exploitation harder on Internet Explorer. It'll cover several attack techniques against isolated heap, uh, some surgical tools to use uh, against memory protection, along with uh, details in, over the ASLR bypass that uh, was generated using memory protection. Then we'll follow it up with, some, with the recommended uh, defenses that we provided Microsoft. This research uh, was awarded $125,000 from Microsoft's bounty program. It still is the highest payout uh, from the Microsoft Bounty Program. It also included the first payout for the defenses side of the Bounty Program, and we're going to go over all of those details today. So a quick overview. Uh, we all work for HP's Zero Day Initiative Program. It's the world's largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program. Uh, we focus on purchasing vulnerabilities from researchers uh, all over the world. We focus on uh, getting those, those bugs fixed. We research advanced exploitation techniques. Um, my name is Brian Gorns. I actually run the Zero Day Initiative program. Uh, my, spend most of my time doing root cause analysis on cases that come in, doing uh, internal vulnerability discovery. Uh, I also uh, organize the Pwn to Own hacking competitions around the world. And, uh, and because of those, those jobs, I get to work a lot with HP's legal organization. Uh, especially with uh, the WASNAR and stuff like that. Uh, doing Pwn to Own is a lot, of, a lot more fun than it used to be. Um, and the introduce Abdul. Um, so I'm Abdul. Uh, I'm a security researcher working for ZDI. I've been working for HP Security Research for the past two years. Uh, I do a lot of root cause analysis and bug discovery. Simon. Hi, and I'm Simon Zuckerbrunn. And on Twitter, I'm Hex Kitchen. Um, I'm with ZDI, I've been with them for a little over a year, and I do a lot of work with Internet Explorer. Yes, so it should be no surprise to anybody in this room that use after free vulnerabilities were a very popular choice for attackers who were targeting go you know, government websites and, and people who were visiting those sites um, and using them in watering hole attacks. Um, but what you see here on the slide is a bunch of CVEs that were being used publicly or known about publicly, um, and, and really something had to be done. Every single you know, month it seemed a new attack was coming out that was leveraging a use after free in Internet Explorer. And finally, Microsoft did do something in mid-2014 to make atta uh, attacking use after free vulnerabilities a little bit harder. And as a result, my, it seems that attackers have shifted away from use after freeze in Internet Explorer and are now focusing on flash vulnerabilities. And what, so what exactly happened? Well, in MS-14035, uh, they introduced isolated heap, which Abdul will go over. Uh, and the month following that, they introduced memory protection, which, which was a, a nice introduction uh, to Internet Explorer to make use after freeze harder to exploit. The side effect that it had um, really was it made it, IE fun to research again. We were receiving a lot of zero, uh, use after free vulnerabilities in, into the zero day initiative program, and it was pretty much, you know, you, you hit the website and a use after free happens, relatively easy to analyze, relatively easy to exploit. And this gave us, um, made it more fun to actually go and analyze those cases, made it a little more complicated. So this is the first time that we've ever actually like shown some of our submission trends into the program. And you can see we're kind of over 2012, 2013, you know, we've got, you know, in the teens kind of coming into the program every month, uh, vulnerabilities into Internet Explorer. And we see a spike in early 2014, and this is because researchers all around the world uh, were developing DOM fuzzers and basically sending their output to us uh, for purchase. And so we kind of, for several months there, we're doing about 40 cases, uh, high 30s every month, analyzing, purchasing, and submitting to Microsoft. And you see in mid-2014, the a kind of a drop, and that's when isolated heap and memory protection came out, and we've kind of leveled off around 25 um, zero days in IE coming through our program every month. So it keeps us busy. IE is one of our main, uh, main vulnerability sources. Kind of talking about the research timeline a little bit before we dig into the attacks. Um, 
you can kind of see all the key dates related to the research. Um, I think some of the more important dates is we had the isolated heap uh, proof of concepts generated basically in under 10 days uh, post the patch. Uh, same with the surgical tools that we're going to use against memory protection. Um, in, in the cases where it can be used, were developed in under, in under 10 days. Um, we had our first working ASLR bypass for uh, against memory protection or using memory protection in early September. Um, we were awarded the $125,000 in November, and we kind of waited to uh, disclose any of the details while we worked out payments to charities. We donated all of the money that we, were, uh, we won from the bounty program to three STEM organizations uh, to encourage research and engineering. Um, and we made the public announcement in February. The, in April, Microsoft came to us and said that they would not fix the issue, uh, issues that we've discovered and would not be using any of the uh, recommended offenses that we provided. So here we are sitting today at Recon, releasing all the details and all the proof of concepts that we, we've provided. So we'll talk about where to get all those at the end of the presentation. And so I'm going to hand it over to Abdul. He's going to go over all of the research related to isolated heap. So isolated heap was introduced in June 2014. Um, so back then we noticed that there's a new heap created with a heap created API, Windows API. Um, so basically the main purpose of um, isolated heap was um, allocating a lot of DOM objects, moving them to an isolated region basically providing some kind of separation of DOM allocations against um, other type of allocations. Um, this was really interesting from an exploitation point of view because it made, it made things harder. As the classical ways of overriding freed objects like using strings and stuff like that would not apply anymore to a lot of DOM objects because they have been isolated, moved to a separate heap. Um, and the classical string allocations are kept in the, in the process heap. Um, so basically, just like any other mitigation, iso isolated heap is not, is not perfect. Um, basically, it does a good job by isolating um, certain allocations, but, but in the same time, it allocates all the objects and all the DOM objects, or most of the DOM objects in one heap. Um, so basically, an attacker can free one of these objects and then, then override it with whatever he wants, whatever type he wants. So basically, basically this, this uh, makes it clear that there's a type confusion issue here. Um, the attacker can also override that object with, with another object of a different size, so it doesn't have to be of a specific of the same exact size, so it can be smaller or bigger. Um, so the attacks on isolated heap are very specific, um, like bug specific. Um, basically, it's highly dependent on the offset being referenced at crash time. Um, so most of the attacks that I'm going to be discussing in my next slides um, will be related to the type confusion issues and, and other misalignment issues. Um, so the first attack that I'll be discussing is, is the aligned allocation attack technique. Basically, it's, it's in a nutshell, just like you have, you have a free isolated object, you free it and you, you, you allocate another isolated object of the same, at the same exact spot. Um, but the only challenge here is that what, what type of object that you would, would actually allocate instead of that object. Um, this scenario or this attack um, works well when you have when you have a bug that uh, or you just have to free that actually references a high offset. Um, so basically, you can always choose or find another DOM object that you can like control certain offsets at that, like high offsets, certain values, or have partial control of. Um, to have this attack um, working properly, we need to uh, totally avoid low fragmentation heap. Um, so re the reason for that is that we're probably going to be allocating. Um, objects of different sizes, so we don't want to end up having these allocations on different buckets, so we want to have it on, on the same exact bucket. So the simplest way to achieve this is, um, like in a nutshell, we have to trigger um, some freeing conditions, like we have to, 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 to free that specific object. Then, um, in case we want to allocate like a bigger object, we have to trigger, um, like massage the heap in order to, um, to free multiple chunks, multiple free chunks. Um, later on, we have to coalesce all the free chunks together in one big chunk. Then we have to spray certain objects or replace that specific object with, with whatever object we want. Uh, we can do it with a, with a bigger object, we can do it with a smaller object, it doesn't matter. It depends whatever scenario we have. And, and finally, it's going to be like reusing trig or trigger their use. So this is, this is my fancy graph here. It, it shows 
Um, we have a C, C table row object, and um, up front we have a C DOM text node. Both are isolated. Basically, in this specific example, um, the C table row, um, the, the free happens on that specific object. And then what we did is we overrode it with a C DOM text node. Um, so the reason why we chose the C DOM text node is that in that specific case, uh, the bug was the referencing, I guess, offset 30. And the C DOM text node contains an interesting value at offset 30 that we can partially control. So this is uh, the Wendy bug dump. It's a before and after. Basically, uh, it shows the C table row before being freed and, and overwritten. And later on, we overwrote it with a C DOM text node. Um, highlighted in yellow is the offset that we're targeting. So basically, C DOM text node contain a that specific offset 40000. Uh, zero, 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 which is which can be sprayed. So basically, we partially control that um, offset. So this is this is at crash time. So uh, when we have a successful overwrite and then we dereference everything, we're gonna have um, at crash time. It, it's dereferencing for zero, 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 as you guys can see. So from there, an attacker can spray that address and then control the flow of execution. Um, so the second attack technique that I'll be discussing is, is the misaligned allocations attack technique. Basically, the aligned attack technique works well for high offsets. But um, in case we have um, a user after feed that references a low offset, that can be kind of problematic. Um, because we don't have a lot of choices when it comes to DOM object that we can override it with and, and have specific low offsets that we can control or partially control. Um, so basically, the idea is if, if we have a, an, an object that's allocated at at let's say address x, then we have to probably start allocations at x minus n. Um, and then we're going to have one of the objects uh, at x minus n being misaligned against the original object, and then we're going to trigger a use, and we're going to have an offset being dereferenced from the misaligned object. So the simple steps are um, basically influence um, the heap to coalesce a lot of free chunks together. And then have, have them like in one big free chunk. Later on, we have to spray random objects um, inside that big free chunk, but in a way that we're going to have one of the objects misaligned against the original object. And later on, we're going to trigger the, the reuse and have, have it dereference something from the misaligned object. So again, this is, this is my fancy graph here. Uh, basically, we have a C table row. Um, up front, we have a C, C button, button object. Both are isolated. Um, again, this, this bug targets the C table row object. Um, basically, what we did is we freed a whole bunch of objects, coalesced all the free chunks together in one big chunk, and then we started spraying random objects. And then at a specific spot, we had the C button misaligned against the original C button row. Basically, then dereferencing an offset from the C button row. So basically, if, you're, if your bug dereferencing, let's say, offset um, X from C table row, you're going to have it dereferencing something different. It's not the same offset from C, C button. Um, so basically, in a nutshell, we need to stabilize the heap in, in a way um, to produce the same exact free um, chunk of the same size every time. And then we're going to have to spray it with random objects. Basically, in, in my specific example, we had we were able to stabilize the heap with this specific code. It's, it's, not, it's not a generic code to always um, produce a, a free chunk of the same size, but it was like bug specific. It worked every time. Um, in that specific example, we had EDI pointing to the middle of the of the free chunk. Um, and later on, we're going to see how it works. Um, the free chunk is of size 110. It, it was always producing the same 110 uh, free chunk. Um, so basically, as you guys can see, this is at crash time. Um, EBX come from, comes from EDI. Basically, EDI points to the middle of um, a big free chunk of size 110. Later on, we're going to see um, at, like when, when we get control. Um, so assuming that we were able to stabilize the heap in a way to give us like the same free chunk of the same size every time, then we would need to actually spray it with, uh, with a bunch of objects. In this specific example, we chose and like I chose to target, um, like to have a misaligned C button object because at a certain offset, it contains a value that I can I can spray. Um, we we can do it in a bunch of ways. We don't have to do it with a C button. Some someone can argue that they can do it with a text area and then set some coordinates, and you're gonna have have it have it working. But the idea is here is just to have a misaligned object against the original object. This one worked well though. 
Um, so this is a crash time. Uh, basically, we had um, EDI uh, plus 1C pointing to 12C00400. It lands on that specific value, which is an offset of the misaligned C button object. And as you guys can guess, this value can be sprayed easily, and then we can gain um, control. So in a nutshell, um, just to wrap it up, um, Isolated Heap does a good job isolating certain DOM objects from other allocations. Um, it's not perfect, still have a lot of type confusion issues, um, it still have misalignment issues. Um, attacking Isolated Heap um, depends on several factors. It's, it's, it's more bug specific, we have to avoid low fragmentation heap as much as possible. And uh, it depends on, on, on the offsets that being dereferenced. So I'm going to give it back to Brian to discuss memory protection. All right. <coughs> so memory protection was introduced in July of 2014, and then months after that, uh, I think the, the patch the month after that, they made some improvements to memory protection. Um, the, what we noticed in, in, in the zero-day initiative is we were analyzing cases, and when that July patch came out, we started to see that the cases that we hadn't purchased yet um, were turning into null pointer dereferences, which was really interesting to us. And so we dig more into that, and we found memory protection uh, messing with the use after freeze that we were looking at. So we have to kind of figure what, what exactly is memory protection. Well, memory protection is a delayed freeing mechanism inside of Internet Explorer, and its purpose is to prevent blocks from being deallocated when they're referenced either on the stack or in processor registers. And it keeps these blocks in a zeroed out state so that they're unusable, and it adds it to a wait list. And every so often, a reclamation process will occur. It will go through that wait list of objects and free them at the heap manager level. And so the way that they actually implemented this is in, instead of calling uh, heap free on these objects, they would call protected free on these objects uh, instead. So we kind of need to understand how the, heap, uh, how the protected free function works. So the first thing that it does when, when protected free is called is it checks the wait list and, and checks to see if it's full. If the wait list is full, it will go ahead and process the reclamation sweep, cleaning up the objects that are no longer referenced. It will, after that, it will add, it to the, add that block to the wait list, and it will zero out and return, it to, and return to the user. If the wait list is not full, which is the case almost all of the time, the, it will check the aggregate size of the blocks on the wait list, and if that aggregate size is, size is over 100,000 bytes, it will then perform a reclamation sweep, add the block to the wait list, zero it out, and return to the caller. If, for example, the, the threshold has not been met, it will add the block to the wait list without performing the reclamation sweep. It will zero out the block and return to the caller. So when we look at this, the most important thing that we need to know about this function is we can ignore the first check as an attacker because we have control of what protected free actually, uh, the, the, the allocations that are going on. And what we're going to focus on is the 100,000 byte threshold. And what we're going to, the most important thing to know is that the reclamation step sweep always occurs before the block is, a new block is added to the wait list. And that's what we're going to leverage later on when we're trying to free uh, at the heat manager level certain uh, use after free conditions. So what, what exactly is the reclamation process? Well, there's that, set, there's that wait list which contains an entry for every block that has been requested to be deallocated. And in that entry, you've got the block's base address, you have the block size, and you have a flag that determines whether it's on the isolated heap or the process heap. It will iterate through those entries on the wait list and check, the, check to see if there are any references to that object on the stack. It will check to see if there's any references to that object in the processor registers. And if there is, then the block is waitlisted, or it continues to be waitlisted. So after the reclamation sweep, the block will still be there, uh, still be zeroed out, still be allocated, and can't be used by the attacker. If the references don't exist, then we have a, the object will be freed at the heap manager level and, and released back. So in the cases where use after, in a use after free, where there, does, there is a reference on the stack or in the processor registers, the uh, memory protection is highly effective. It will keep those blocks allocated so that you can't allocate something underneath them and reuse them in a malicious way. 
So the, um, the, but there's that subset of use after freeze that aren't referenced anymore, but there's still memory protection is still uh, changing the way that the application actually operates. Uh, and so it, it causes them some challenges. So what are the challenges that memory protection uh, presents an attacker for the subset of use after freeze that are no, that are no longer being referenced. Well, first, there's the de the deallocation delay, and this is because there's a that reclamation sweep that we're waiting for to perform before it would actually get deallocated. Next, there's several non-determinism non-determinism uh, that that exists because of memory protection. First is the non-determinism produced by stack, what we're calling stack junk, which could be uh, non-pointers or stale pointers that are left over on the, in stack buffers that are not clear to their former use. It may just so happen that those stale pointers or values that are on the stack will, could point into an object that you want to be deallocated, but because that, that stack junk exists, the memory protection will not free that object. There's also complexity determining deallocation time due to the number of objects on the wait list. So your timing could be off, along with a complex heap manager behavior uh, due to reordering uh, of the wait list, which will result in unstable stack conditions, which you kind of need for certain UAF situations. So what can we do? Well, the first elementary attack technique is just the generic memory pressuring loop that's been used and used after freeze for a long time to force garbage collection, where we'd allocate over 100,000 bytes worth of objects, and then we would free them, force reclamation, and clear it out. Well, that definitely defeats the deallocation delay challenge, but it doesn't stop the non-determinism challenge that exists due to memory protection. When we submitted this paper back in October of 2014, there was an unconditional reclamation step when uh, uh, WND proc was uh, entered to service a, um, service a message on the uh, thread's main, when, when WN proc is actually entered. The, this uh, unconditional reclamation step post uh, September 2014 uh, was rendered non-functional by Microsoft, and so this attack technique no longer works, which was basically to delay execution of the exploit until that, that event happened and that unconditional reclamation sweep occurred. Now, use after freeze are sometimes timing-based, and so you need to, uh, this doesn't always work, but because Microsoft basically rendered it non-functional, uh, it really doesn't matter, but for record, it's there. So what do we want to do? We want to be able to remove the non-determination uh, we want to be able to delay deallocation. And so what are we going to rely on? Well, we're going to rely on the fact that memory protection first checks the size of the wait list and bef before it perform performs a reclamation sweep, and only afterwards does it add that current block to the wait list. So when you call protected free on block at address A, A will definitely not be reclaimed on that call, but it will definitely be on the wait list when the call is complete. So we're going to leverage that fact to um, make sure we can organize our calls in a way that will guarantee that we deallocate block a block that we want to um, use and use after free. We're also going to rely on the fact that the isolated um, that the it doesn't matter which heap the object is on, it um, it could be on the isolated heap or the process heap. So step one, we want to be able to prep the wait list, and we're going to do this by finding a method to trigger arbitrarily sized buffer allocations. So when we find that method, we'll allocate a buffer of 100,000 bytes. We will then free that buffer, which because the, wait, uh, because the wait list, because of protected free in the way that it operates, it will add that block to the wait list. And at this point, we know the next time we call protected free, it will then free uh, the blocks that are ready to be reclaimed. So you can kind of see that's the state of the wait list. At the point, we have a set of blocks X on the wait list that are waiting to be freed. If they're not referenced anymore, then there's a block um, of 100,000 bytes that guarantees we hit the reclamation step on the next call of protected free. So we're going to trigger another block. And the purpose of this, these steps is to get the wait list into a known state and an approximate size. So we're going to trigger the allocation of a block of size F. We're going to free that block, which protected free will be called on that object. And a reclamation step will per be performed because we've reached that threshold of 100,000 bytes. It will go through and iterate through that wait list, freeing any block that's no longer referenced 
uh, by the application on the stack or the process registers. And it will also free block A, which will bring the wait list into a consistent state and, and, and a good size. After all the freeing is done, it will add block B, which will bring that wait list to a, a consistent size. And at this point, we have a, a good idea of what the wait list actually looks like. So next, we're gonna set up the freeing of block C, which is the, the object that we wanna perform our use after free attack on. And our purpose now with these steps is to cleanly deallocate block C with the minimal amount of additional heap operations. So we, call it, we, we free object C, which calls protected free. We no longer are over the threshold, so it adds that block to the wait list. Then we allocate that 100,000 byte block we free that block, but because we're not at the wait list, we're not at the threshold yet, it will add it to the wait list. We will then allocate another block, which will put us over the wait list and trigger the reclamation step on the next call to protected free. And at this point, when we call free on, on object E, we will be freeing uh, object C and object D, and reliably, we know then exactly when we're able to deallocate block object C. We can then use the isolated heap techniques that um, Abdul talked about to uh, perform a use after a free attack against object C. So you can see what the wait list looks at that point. So we need that method for arbitrarily uh, allocating uh, objects and arbitrarily freeing objects. And we can't really rely on sysalloc string or sysfree string based string buffers um, because they don't use protected free and that's what we need. So in this case, cstir comes to our aid in MSHTML and we can use the DOM method, uh, get elements by class name, and in that method, it will, it will uh, create a, uh, a cstir using the string value passed in and then later, it will deallocate using protected free that string. And that's what we're going to use for the arbitrary allocation and deallocation of, of, of objects and manipulating the, the wait list and memory protection. To do this, you actually have to do a priming procedure against uh, the DOM object, and we'll talk about it in, in a second. And really, the only limitations to this is the fact that there is a limitation on the size of the object. The smallest buffer you can use in CSTR is 56 hex, but there is no upper limit, so we can be guaranteed that we're going to hit that threshold of 100,000 bytes uh, in that check inside of uh, protected free. So what does the code look like? Well, this is, this is it. Pretty simple. First, we're going to create an object, a, a, a DOM object. We're going to call, the priming procedure is basically calling get elements by class name with the string that you're going to use later and keeping a reference to the returned value. Then any other subsequent call to get elements by class name using that string will reliably allocate a cster at a size and deallocate that, that same object um, using protected free. And as a result, we can now take the steps that we laid out previously to reliably deallocate an object that is not uh, completely uh, mitigated by memory protection. So we'll show you a video of a, uh, one of the proof of concepts that we provided Microsoft of one of the cases that we had submitted, uh, one of our researcher cases that we took to uh, controlling the register. Basically, it's using that get elements by class name technique to reliably deallocate that object and then using the isolated heap techniques, uh, the aligned allocations that Abdul talked about to um, get control of the register, uh, the EIP register. So now I'm going to hand it over to Simon and he will go over bypassing ASLR uh, and also all the recommended defenses. Okay, um, in this section, we're going to talk about uh, how we were able to abuse memory protection to get a bypass of ASLR. So after I got comfortable with these techniques of uh, making precision modifications to the memory protection state, uh, I went back and I started thinking some more about something I'd read in a blog post by Fortinet uh, back in July of 2014. Um, and to progress from that blog post, um, back in 2013, Dion showed how um, conservative garbage collectors used by script engines can be attacked to leak information about heap addresses. Um, so does memory protection provide a new surface for a similar attack? So that's an interesting idea. Uh, in a sense, 
uh, memory protection acts like a conservative garbage collector, freeing allocated memory only if no references are found on the stack. Um, this means that it might be susceptible to an attack similar to the garbage collection attack done by Dion. Uh, the key idea here is that when memory protection examines values on the stack, uh, it doesn't understand anything about the semantics of those values. It, it treats each D word as if it is potentially a pointer. So, if we'd like, we can plant a chosen value on the stack and uh, memory protection will interpret it as a pointer. Uh, memory protection will then exhibit different behavior depending on whether or not the integer that we chose corresponds to an address of waitlisted memory. So uh, here we see a uh, block of memory that is waitlisted. So uh, let's say we plant an integer value on the stack and uh, then trigger the memory protection reclamation routine. Uh, if the integer that we planted corresponds to an address anywhere within the block, um, then memory protection will respond in one way and uh, by keeping the block on the waitlist. Um, but if the integer we planted is not within the waitlisted block, then memory protection will behave in a different way and it will deallocate the block. So it's starting to sound like we may have a way to reveal information about the layout of the address space. We can repeatedly guess an address, plant it as an integer on the stack, uh, and get memory protection to behave in a way that reveals whether or not we have correctly guessed the address of a certain targeted block in memory. Uh, in other words, we have an oracle. Or do we? Because at this point, there's still a very big problem. Let's take a look at the programmatic contract that's exposed by memory protection. Hmm. But aside from that DLL notification, which is not something that gets called during normal program operation, memory protection does not ever return even a single piece of data uh, from any of its methods. Um, that's a problem. Is we can influence memory protection to, um, based on whether we've guessed the correct address or not. But, but to have an oracle, uh, we need to have the ability to read some kind of a response back. And memory protection's API uh, gives us absolutely nothing. So uh, what this means is we need a side channel. So um, when I was thinking about this, the first thing that came to mind was that maybe we could use a timing attack. Uh, then something else came along. Uh, it was in the summer of 2014, and uh, some cases started, started coming into uh, ZDI that were kind of unusual. Uh, we were seeing proof of concept code that would expose bad code paths in the Internet Explorer by subjecting the browser to memory pressure. The code would do some lengthy loop, doing repeated DOM manipulations and also consuming memory. And then at some point, when address space was uh, nearly exhausted and memory allocations were starting to fail, a code path would be triggered that was vulnerable. Um, it was striking how a reasonably reliable trigger could be constructed in this way, uh, even though the browser process was under a, such a high level of stress. Uh, I started to think about the idea of operating the browser in a regime of high memory pressure. It's relatively unexplored territory. What kinds of things can we make happen? It struck me as interesting. But something else I noticed was that when script requests an operation that requires a heap allocation, and the allocation fails due to a lack of available memory, the script receives an out-of-memory exception. Here we have a way for attacker's script to detect whether an allocation was a success or a failure. All it needs to do is check for the exception. And it, here's the crucial insight. Script can detect whether an allocation succeeds or fails. And whether it succeeds or fails is a function of the existing state of the heap. In other words, JavaScript out of memory exceptions are a side channel that reveals information about the state of the heap. That's exactly the side channel we need 
in order to get information back from memory protection. Right. Here's the high-level view of how we consult the memory protection oracle. So don't be concerned about the exact details. I'm going to get that, to that uh, just a bit later. For now, let's appreciate the high-level structure of what we're going to do. Uh, say we have a block of memory on the memory protection waitlist, and uh, we want to consult the oracle to determine whether a certain address, x, is an address that falls within the block. So we plant x on the stack as an integer, and we, then we do something that triggers the reclamation routine. In response, memory protection modifies the heap in a way that's dependent on whether x points within the targeted block. How do we find out how memory protection has responded? We attempt a heap allocation that is designed to either succeed or fail depending on what memory protection has done to the heap. Then, by checking for the presence or absence of an out-of-memory exception, we can make a deduction about how memory protection has behaved, and then this reveals the answer to whether x falls within the targeted block of memory. So here's the whole chain of deductions we make. The presence or absence of an out-of-memory exception tells us something about the state of the heap. The state of the heap tells us something about how memory protection behaved, and how memory protection behaved tells us whether x falls within the targeted block. That's the high-level view. Well, clearly, to actualize all this, it's going to take some pretty careful setup. But here's the thing. Going back to something I'd mentioned earlier, once you start thinking about what you can do in a regime of high memory pressure, some really interesting possibilities open up. Uh, but before going any further, though, I'd like to refine what we mean by high memory pressure. It's more subtle than just piling on lots of pressure until there's almost no memory left. Um, first of all, it's not really available memory we're talking about. It's um, availability of address space. In a 32-bit process, um, the limiting factor that's going to cause allocation failures is not memory exhaustion, it's address space exhaustion. Um, so the next thing to note, is it's possible for allocations to fail even if there's plenty of address space left. It all just depends on how large of an allocation you're asking for. Um, also, you know, it's not the aggregate amount of remaining address space that matters. It's whether a large enough contiguous free region can be found. So let's refine our idea as follows. Operating the browser in a regime of limited availability of large contiguous regions of free address space. So let's play with this a little bit. Um, suppose we spray the heap with one megabyte allocations until all me address space is consumed. And then we free one of those one megabyte blocks. What's left is a one megabyte hole. And that hole is going to be the one and only contiguous region of one megabytes of free addresses. We can, actually, we can leave lots of smaller holes also, and it doesn't change the fact that uh, we have exactly one hole that's one megabyte big. Uh, if we now we go back and we make one more one, meg one megabyte a um, allocation, we know it will be placed right in that hole because that's the only place it can fit. Um, we can actually keep doing this over and over, allocating a one megabyte block and freeing it, allocating a one megabyte block and freeing it, and every single time it's going to be allocated in exactly the same place. So now, what would happen if one time we tried to make that allocation? but it failed. What, what, what would that tell us? Well, what could make that happen? Well, one thing that could make that happen if, uh, is uh, if some other uh, allocation went up and uh, came around and, uh, and, uh, al and occupied that hole. Um, but uh, you know, let's say that we can rule that out because we know there are no other big allocations going on. So um, what would that tell us? Um, we might be able to conclude that what happened was that the last time that we freed the one megabyte allocation, it never really got freed because memory protection was holding on to it. So we have a way of telling whether the hole is free or occupied by trying to make a new one megabyte allocation 
and checking to see if an out-of-memory exception is thrown. All right, so now we have all the main pieces in place to make an attack possible. So first we prepare memory so there's just one large contiguous free region, let's say one megabyte in size, but it could be any size we like. Um, we're going to call that the whole or the region. What we're going to try to do is use memory protection as an oracle to determine where that hole is in memory. Uh, so we're going to guess an address X, and we want to consult the oracle to determine uh, if X falls within the hole. Um, so what we're going to do is first we'll make a one megabyte allocation, so now the hole is occupied. And next we're going to free that uh, allocation, meaning that it gets passed to protected free, and protected free puts the allocation on the wait list. As far as the Windows heap manager is concerned, the memory is still allocated. Uh, then we're going to plant X as an integer on the stack, and while X is there on the stack, we're going to do something that triggers memory reclamation. Uh, now, what happens next depends on whether X falls within this one megabyte address region or not. If X falls within the address region, then when memory protection performs reclamation, uh, it'll keep this allocation on the wait list and it won't free it um, on the heap manager level. Uh, otherwise, if X doesn't fall within the region, then mem memory protection will remove the application, uh, the, this allocation from the wait list uh, and uh, invoke heap free, which completely deallocates that block. So um, this shows the two possible states that uh, we can end up in. If X falls within the region, uh, then the hole stays occupied. Uh, but if X does not fall within the region, then the hole gets opened up again. Uh, last step, to tell which of these two states we just ended up in, all we need to do is make one more one megabyte allocation. If it succeeds, we know that the hole got opened. And this means that X wasn't within the region, um, but if we get an out-of-memory exception, then we know that the hole stayed occupied, which tells us that X falls within the region. Now we have an answer from the oracle. And uh, then by repeating this process with different values of X, uh, we can use the oracle to find out exactly where this one megabyte hole is in memory. So now I'm going to go back to this idea just one more time. When we operate the browser in a regime of limited availability of contiguous regions of free address space, uh, the new possibilities that arise can be quite interesting, and it actually is going to lead us to what we can do next. Uh, so far, what we have is a way to prepare the address space so there's just one large hole of available addresses um, of, of a size of our choosing, uh, and then to use the memory protection oracle to determine the exact addresses of that hole. So how can we make good use of this ability? What can an attacker gain from knowing the address of a hole in the address space? We can load a module into it. We can start by creating a hole that's exactly the right size for loading a particular module. Then, using the memory protection oracle, we leak the address of the hole, Finally, we cause the loading of the module. It gets loaded exactly at the beginning of the hole because that's the, the only place where it's going to fit. So it's actually an ASLR bypass, and it runs really efficiently and reliably. We're going to show a demo video here, what it looks like to run. Um, this is a fully patched IE. On that demo video. And it's got the address already. Popping up WinDebug. Check that address. And there it is. Okay, so this has been a lot of fun. Um, it started out looking like something that was non-exploitable, turned out in the end to be a reliable ASLR bypass. And the key insight that made it possible um, is that uh, JavaScript out-of-memory exceptions are a side channel that reveals critical information about the state of the heap. Um, I don't think it's been recognized before. 
Uh, and there are really interesting possibilities that open up when you operate the browser under memory pressure. Okay, so yeah, we've made several recommendations to Microsoft uh, for ways that they can improve isolated heap and memory protection to harden them against the attacks we've discovered. Um, in regard to memory protection, we've seen how in various situations the attacker can benefit from the ability to make precision modifications to the state of memory protection. And uh, we've even shown that this leads to a breakdown of ASLR. Um, to make memory protection resistant to attempts to normalize and to control its state, um, we make the recommenda recommendation to remove memory protection from array and buffer allocations. This means that memory protection would apply only to scalar allocations. Uh, our rationale is that one almost never finds an exploitable use after free condition in Internet Explorer where the freed object is an array or a buffer. Uh, on very rare occasion, we have seen UAF cases submitted to a zero-day initiative where the freed object is some sort of string data. Uh, but in every case, um, these have turned out to be non-exploitable conditions. And uh, since UAFs of arrays and buffers in Internet Explorer are rare to non-existent, the benefit of applying memory protection to these allocations is doubtful. Uh, on the other hand, we've demonstrated how it can be a very significant benefit to an attacker. We therefore feel that memory protection will be a stronger defense if applied to scalar allocations only. Our next suggestion per, uh, pertains to strengthening ASLR. Um, taking a look at how we got ASLR to fail, um, what you can notice is that the attacker was able to violate one of ASLR's assumptions by preparing the address space in a particular way. Um, do you know Dizovi made a similar observation when he said, thinking about security mitigations like DEP and ASLR designed for server-side code doesn't work when you give your attacker an interpreter. So I feel that ASLR needs to be strengthened for the browser because the browser is an inherently more hostile environment. Um, here's the particular assumption that ASLR makes, that when it chooses a load address for a module from among the set of possible load addresses, that this random choice will exhibit a significant amount of entropy. But an attacker can break this assumption by radically narrowing the set of possible load addresses before the module loads. Uh, our recommendation is to enhance ASLR by adding an additional check before loading a module. Uh, this check is to ensure that there really do exist a multiplicity of addresses at which the requested module could load before actually performing the random selection of a load address. Um, if the number of possible load addresses is below a certain threshold, the module load should fail uh, since, under the mo since loading this, the module under this circumstance could significantly weaken the security of the entire process. Um, ideally, this mitigation would be Im implemented at the kernel level, and it could be made uh, available on an opt-in basis for executables such as browsers, uh, which are a more hostile environment, as we mentioned. Um, it would also be possible to implement this mitigation in user land code at the application level by hooking the relevant system calls. Um, here's a quick site sequence diagram showing how the entropy check works. The application requests the module to be loaded, Kernel examines how many places in memory available for the module to load. Kernel decides that the minimum threshold is met, and it proceeds to choose one of the possible load addresses at random to load the module, and it returns success to the caller. Uh, while the kernel is responding to the module load request, it locks changes to the address space to prevent a time of check, time of use attack. Uh, another time, the application requests the module to be loaded, Kernel examines how many places in memory are available for the module to load. This time, the kernel detects that there are too few possible load addresses. The kernel denies the module load requests, returns failure to the application, and this shows the locking that takes place during the second request. Okay. Next recommendation is regard to out-of-memory exceptions. Uh, we've shown that JavaScript out-of-memory exceptions are a side channel that reveals information about the state of the heap. Uh, although this leaked bit of information might seem insignificant at first, uh, we have shown how it can actually be leveraged to great effect. Uh, it should also be mentioned that out-of-memory exceptions uh, greatly aid the attacker in setting up conditions of memory pressure. 
that are needed for our ASLR bypass attack, as well as triggering other vulnerabilities that are dependent on memory pressure. We therefore recommend considering eliminating out of memory exceptions in script. Um, when an allocation fails due to memory or address space exhaustion, instead of passing an exception up to script code where it can be handled, the condition should be considered as fatal to the process, or at least fatal to script execution within the process. This seems unlikely to have a significant negative impact upon legitimate web pages and web applications. Finally, we recommend uh, taking uh, ISO, the next, uh, ISO heap to the next logical step by creating uh, additional separate heaps. Ideally, one could have a separate heap for each scalar type. Uh, this would bring two great benefits. First, a use after free condition could never lead to type confusion since every type is confined to its own heap. Secondly, since each heap consists entirely of objects of homogeneous size, uh, misalignments will not arise. Actually, this last point is made trickier by storage of C++ arrays because uh, C++ arrays can introduce misalignment because when an array is stored, the individual elements uh, don't have heap metadata added to them the way that heap metadata is added to the individual scalar allocations. Um, and plus, the C++ compiler adds some metadata of its own uh, to arrays to store the array's dimensions. So it's actually possible to use C++ arrays to introduce misalignment into heaps. Um, however, as we've mentioned, uh, exploitable UAFs in uh, arrays and buffers are extremely rare in Internet Explorer, so we recommend just leaving all array and buffer allocations on the default heap uh, instead. And if we do that, it should become impossible for an attacker to produce misalignments on the isolated heaps. Um, actually, there's another completely separate reason why it's best to leave arrays and buffers on the main process heap. I'd like to digress a moment to explain why. Um, there's something that doesn't get much attention when ISO heap is discussed, and that's uh, what could be called an address reuse attack. What's that? Well, Consider how ISOHEAP is supposed to ensure that when a DOM object is freed, then an attacker won't be able to allocate some other non-DOM type object in its place, such as a string. Uh, ISOHEAP tries to ensure this uh, by, make, by making sure that DOM allocations and string allocations don't happen on the same heap. But here's the thing. The attacker doesn't care about heaps. The attacker only cares about addresses. Is it possible for the address of a freed DOM object to later on be the address of a string allocation? Well, this would become possible if, say, the ISO heap, which is the heap on which DOM objects are stored, sometimes relinquishes control of virtual address space that it no longer needs. That would create the opportunity for those same addresses to later become part of a different heap, such as the process heap then a string could be allocated there. Is this attack actually possible? Currently, this attack is not possible. Here's why. Um, the way the Windows Heap Manager works with small allocations is that it puts them inside regions of virtual memory called heap segments. And uh, once a particular heap reserves a segment, it never relinquishes control of those virtual addresses. For as long as that heap lives, uh, it's never going to allow those addresses to become part of any other heap. Um, and today, um, the ISO heap is used only for small scalar allocations, so it's good. But if instead, IE tried to protect large buffer allocations by placing them on the ISO heap, then isolation wouldn't be guaranteed. Um, for large allocations, the heap manager doesn't use heap segments. When the heap manager freed the buffer, it would relinquish control over the virtual addresses involved, and later on, those virtual addresses could become part of a different heap, um, breaking the isolation. So what this means for us is that it's pointless uh, using Windows Heap Manager to try to protect buffers and arrays by placing them on an isolated heap. Um, that isolation could be easily broken using an address reuse attack. Uh, the bottom line is, best way is to keep array and buffer allocations on the default heap and have a separate isolated heap 
uh, for every type of scalar applica uh, allocation, um, then those uh, isolated heaps will be completely immune to type confusion and misalignment issues. Um, so by having a separate heap for every scalar type is highly beneficial, but uh, the drawback is that it may be too wasteful of address space in a 32-bit process, 32 process where uh, address space is a scarce resource. Uh, so we're faced with a trade-off between security and address space usage. What can we do to make the best of this trade-off? We're only going to be able to create a limited number of heaps. How can we make things as horrid as possible for an attacker uh, using only a limited number of heaps? In whatever way we make assignments of types to heaps, uh, an attacker who has discovered a UAF on uh, one particular heap will try to construct an exploit uh, via type confusion and or misalignment uh, by making use of the various types that we have assigned to that same heap. Unless we randomize the assignments between heaps and types, uh, we can break the monoculture of heap partitioning and instead random partitioning at process startup time. This denies to the attacker the ability to write um, a reliable exploit that relies on knowledge of which types are co-located on a heap. Um, it optimizes the defender's advantage when we make the trade-off between security and the number of heaps we're willing to create. Um, here's how randomized heap partitioning can function. At process startup time, the process creates a certain configured number of heaps. This number should be chosen based on the trade-off between security and address space usage. Then it allocates an array having one element corresponding to each scalar type in the application. The initialization code then populates each element of the array with a heap handle chosen at random from among the available heaps. Then whenever application code performs a heap allocation of a particular scalar type, just looks up the appropriate heap handle in the array and uses that heap. And the same applies to deallocation. We expect that randomized heap partitioning will make exploits a lot messier because the types that are needed for type confusion and or misalignment are never guaranteed to be on the heap that the attacker needs them to be on. Uh, exploit reliability will suffer as a result. Failed exploit attempts typically result in process crashes, uh, making attacks easier to detect. This means that O-Days in the wild can be discovered and patched more quickly. Also, the attacker gains no knowledge from crashes since a new randomization is done with every process stored up. Uh, in sum, randomized heap partitioning seem, serves to minimize the benefit that the attacker can hope to attain uh, relative to the cost of discovering UAFs and developing and fielding exploits for them. So to recap the new defenses we're recommending, remove memory protection from arrays and buffers, strengthen ASLR by making a positive check for entropy in load address selection, um, consider eliminating JavaScript and out of, uh, JavaScript out of memory exceptions, create one heap per type in 64-bit processes, use randomized heap partitioning in 32-bit processes. All right, so. Just kind of a little bit of conclusion. Of course, we have uh, many use after freeze coming into our program. We have attacks against isolated heap. We have attacks against uh, memory protection and an ASLR break. So why not put it all together into an exploit? So we did that for the bounty submission. And so um, not that most of us have not seen a IEA exploit before, but at the time it was, it was the latest patched IE. And what you're gonna see it do is it's going to run and break ASLR. Uh, it'll say retry once, and then it will get the, the load address and then exploit the use after free vulnerability and pop calc. Bingo. So we could chain this with one of the many uh, sandbox escapes that we know about in, in, in IE uh, to do some damage. So we are releasing all of the research uh, that we did for the Microsoft Bounty program. It's actually up on GitHub right now. I just checked. Um, we've released the white paper that we, submit, uh, that we submitted to Microsoft. Uh, we have uh, proof of concepts up there for the uh, memory protection and isolated heap stuff. Uh, we, have an, we have put ASLR bypasses up that target uh, Windows 
uh, 7 IE 11 in default configuration. We've also uploaded a ASLR bypass that works against Windows 8.1 uh, IE 11 in default configuration up there because they decided not to fix it, um, even though we provided a uh, quite a bit of recommended defenses. Um, so. In conclusion, uh, this research was a lot of fun. Uh, we got to uh, kind of come at it from another side. We're usually the ones deciding how much to pay for vulnerabilities and exploits. And in this case, we uh, put our research up uh, to another company to uh, judge it. And so it was an interesting experience. We learned a lot going through it. I really had a good experience with Microsoft uh, dealing with them. And um, you know, so this is where we sit today. Is there any questions? Hello. Um, do you have any technique for avoiding LFH after a user's in some indeterminate state of browsing? Um, uh, this, can be, this can be a little bit tricky. Um, I don't think there's a generic way to do it, but it's, it's, it's solely bug specific. So some of those slides read. Hey, uh, some of those slides read patent pending. Are these mitigations um, encumbered by patents? Uh, some of them are patent pending. Yes, uh, for Microsoft specifically, with the way that the bounty program works, the um, uh, releases rights to them to use them all. My memory protection, yeah, uh, my memory pressuring technique uh, does not apply to 64-bit processes. Any other? All right, thank you for your time. Uh, enjoy playing with the proof of concepts.